Just finishing off my daily alarm from Phil's. I'm Schmitty and this is Talking Schmidt. Today on the show is David Reyes. David is a rad dude. He's fucking just put out a sick part on the Thrasher site. Finishing up with a tray flip nose blunt down Clipper that took him seven times. Not seven attempts, kids. Seven trips to the spot. Seven different days. Listen to him and I talk about ice cream. Foundation. King of the road. The Thrasher cover. All kinds of stuff. I love Dave. Hope you guys do too. Gonna hear from our sponsors real quick. Kick it into the uh, episode. But I do want to mention... All you skate shops in the U.S., we got a distributor at AWH. So if you're shopping for your goods at AWH, tickety-tack over and pick up some Talking Schmidt. Tickety-tack. If you're in Japan, you already know. Hit up Underdog Distribution. And up in Canada, we got Platform Distribution. Wheeling and dealing, eh? Keegan Souter, Alex Chalmers, Rick McCrank, all you bros, let's do some podcasting. Big love, uh, September's almost over, kids, this fucking year is flying, love you, hope you're all safe, and uh, peace. Hey, it's Corey at Blue Plate, 3218 Mission Street, come see us, meatloaf, fried chicken, deviled eggs. Dollar Olympia beers. We're here every day of the week. We got a garden and we got smiles on our faces. Come let us make you happy. Oh yeah, here we go. Born in Missoula, Missoula, Montana. Girls on Shred, Montana Skate Park Association. We've got good things going on up here. Born in Missoula, on the hip strip. 618 South Higgins, come check us out. Thanks for talking Schmidt. This is David Reyes, and you're watching, or you're listening, or are we watching Talking Schmidt? <laughs> it's cool, like tonight is the night. Here we go again. Just give it the old cause turn, isn't it? All big dogs in. Schmitty! 96 times, Schmitty. Thanks, Schmitty. We on? Schmitty? Talking Schmidt. That's called going to the hospital, bitch. I be <laughs> shit in my pants. Man. Your Rolodex is fucking deep. It's right. about the one, the one, the one. Who is this guy? He thinks he's tough shit. What's up? We're tastemakers. Come on, Smitty, what the fuck? Let's hear it for Greg Smith. Yeah! All right. I, I'm, I'm claiming I met my next guest on the 2007 King of the Road. It was the finale at Black Box, and Slash was jumping fucking garbage cans with nudes and jamie thomas was doing tray flips on some old board and over in the corner was my next guest keeping it tight we've been ice cream bros ever since and uh he rides for thank you skateboards this is mr david reyes yeah solid intro look at that huh (laughs) that was good hey how are you i'm good just hanging on the couch with this nugget you got a doggy? Oh, damn. Big baby. I have you cropped up on a liquid death can. <laughs> oh, shit. The following episode is sponsored by yeah. Liquid Death. You look great. Well, that's because... You got the It's It shirt. Yeah. Yes. Look at that shirt. Look at that shit. <laughs> uh, I wish I had mine. It's a comfortable shirt. I, I was thinking about when I put it on, I was like... I've been doing these crazy Ben and Jerry uh, daily pints. And then oh. I was like, don't worry, it's it. I ain't cheating on you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a in breach of contract. It was funny. Dan Pencil said it. it was like you go from pints of beer to pints of ice cream. <laughs> so true. I had to cut myself off for like I did 16 weeks off cookies. 
you just influence somebody. That's four months. Yeah, I would do. So I would bake 24 cookies and then I would get a pint of ice cream and I would make mini ice cream sandwiches. And I was like, I can eat like four of these and I'll be fine. But then after I ate four of them, I just looked over and I would see like the rest of the cookies and I would just start eating cookies. And then I would get, um, I have like oat milk now since I'm a veteran, (laughs) I'm an old dog. And, uh, I would eat all 20 cookies and then I would go back to the pint of ice cream and I would just eat it till it was even. And then eventually it was gone. (laughs) And I did that way too often. That's what I was telling my wife is like, no matter how much stuff you put in the, like, if you make 30 cookies, I'll eat 30. If you make four, I'll eat four. Like, it's like, I can't just let them sit around. I just, I just keep eating them, but I got this idea. I don't know if it'll work, but I've been thinking about this because I've been really enjoying my ice cream. And I'm like, what if every day I ate an amount and then the next day I weighed myself? And then I figured out the amount that I can eat of ice cream <laughs> with everything else to kind of stay without gaining weight. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm sacrificing lunch so I can get that pint tonight or whatever yeah. I got to do. You just figure it out and then you live comfortably. You're just like, that's a good idea. I don't know. <laughs> I just figure I'm so active that I can eat 24 cookies and a pint of ice cream. <laughs> Dude, I was talking to a shot about it and he because he sweats like a motherfucker and he's like, yeah, dude, he needs to eat so goddamn much. I was like, lucky. He's like, no, yeah. I skate a lot, bro. I was like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I'm not skating, I'm riding my bike. And if I'm not riding my bike, I'm like walking golf course. There's always like something mm. that's like I'm like sweating. I found out a little something doing some research. You actually were not born in Colorado, right? No, I was born in Yonkers, New York. Okay. And when yeah. when did you move to Colorado? When I was about five or six. Okay. Yeah. So, but you found skating in Colorado or did you already skate have a board? I found skating in Colorado and I, I feel like I was like born in Colorado. That's where life started for me. Was uh, that Denver? Denver, Colorado. And then how did you uh, end up with a skateboard for the first time? It's a long story, but just like the transitioning from moving from New York to Colorado was the background pretty much of my life is like, uh, like a poor family, an abusive father. And it got so bad that it was either moved to California or to Denver. And obviously, California has always been expensive. So that was out of our budget. But my grandparents took us under their wing and decided that Colorado was probably the best place to raise some kids, a handful of them. Mm. I'm uh, the second oldest of four. Okay. And uh, mom singly, single handedly raised all four of us. We always lived in like lower income housing. So it was like apartments or townhomes. And, um, one of the townhomes that we had moved to, which was on Colfax and Federal, it's like right at the meet meetup part. Mm. And um, my neighbors, John Braun and Sam, like what was his last name? I think it was, it might've been like Sam Smith or some shit. Okay. Forget his last name. But um, they would always be out skating. And I, I was always into like BMXing or like rollerblading or anything that I could kind of just put my life on the line and, kind of just it was like an adrenaline junkie at a young age Mm -hmm. so um so i always wanted to start skating um just didn't have like the funds to do it to just get that a first initial complete and um my neighbor d'angelo who i used to hear his mom whoop his ass all the time because he was just a bad he was just a baby's kid just a bad kid um him and i started hanging out and breaking into cars when I was like 10 years old. Oh, shit. Yeah, like stealing the car radios and then selling them to this dude, Rob, for <laughs> like 20 bucks and like smoking joints and shit. And um, eventually it caught up to us. And one night we were breaking into a car and the window shattered and it cut his arm up. And when it cut his arm, we just like 
scrambled. We, we got out of there as fast as we could. The next day, the sheriffs were knocking at our doors and we're actual neighbors. Like we share a wall. Uh. And, um, he tried to throw the blame all on me. And that's when I figured like that lifestyle is just so ass backwards. Like they'll say, I got your back till the end, blah, whatever, whatever, until they actually have to like get your back. Then they're going to backstab you or they're going to throw you under the bus to protect their ass. That was the day I realized I had to do something else. And I went and talked to John Braun and he made me mixtapes, VHS mixtapes, like eight hour long mixtapes of skate videos, like fucking all the toy machine videos, jump off, like fucking jump off a building, zero videos, skate and destroy, like just eight hour mixtapes. And then that was the moment I got infatuated with it. I loved like the individuality and the way that you don't need anyone to be satisfied. You get to just kind of go and do your own thing right. and experience like things that you wouldn't experience in like a normal job, you know, right. like we're like hanging out in ditches for hours and we're completely content with that. Or we're just like eating like shit, but it's literally just to get the job done so we can skate and enjoy our the rest of the day. So I had the mixtapes. My mom got her SSI check and took me to target and I got an X games board. <laughs> but what's cool about the X games board is that, it was an actual board. It wasn't like a really bad shitty, like dipped in water complete. Uh, it was like solid wood. It wasn't overly thick. The wheels were like a hard urethane. The holes were drilled the exact same on like a normal board. Uh, so I could keep using those trucks. And uh, I was about 10 or 11 years old. Cause I was breaking into cars when I was like 10. <laughs> yeah. And then that's uh, pretty sick, to fucking little. Pew. And that was like <laughs> just having the D'Angelo kind of just throw me under the bus and like try to give me all the blame. I was like, it's not the life I want to live, you know. Like, and that is crazy. Did you guys ever talk after that? No, actually, I think he. I think he might still be doing prison time for some other shit that he did. Oh, so fuck. like the route I could have taken was like um it was shown to me at a young age and like that style of living is like my family you know like my oldest sister was involved in it like my dad's side of the family was all involved in it it was just like i could either follow those footsteps and go down that same rabbit hole or i could like venture off and do something that our family's never done you know right so. fuck well e40 said everybody's got choices yep. yeah yeah Sometimes all it takes is uh, that one situation to like yes. wake you up, you know, like you can struggle every day and do like bad things to get by, or you can find something that you're truly passionate about and try to do good with it. Who are the dudes that you were fucking magnetized towards? Like, who were you seeing in magazines and videos early on that you were like, that's my dude? Um, The first hard copy video I actually had was a four in one volume 33. Uh -huh. And that was like with the box and everything. Um, and in that one, it was like Kerchart did that 50, 50 in the opener. Oh. And I was like, damn, that guy's pretty kick ass. Yeah. And then there was like Jeff Lenosi had something. So, I mean, there was like those dudes, obviously when it came down to like, those are my guys. It was like Rodney versus day one round one oh mama and then like mark johnson in the a team section and like those were my guys you know i was like fuck yeah i want to like the feet right you just like look at like mark johnson's feet same as day one it's just like what the fuck it's like they yeah. don't adjust them they're just perfect they're quick yeah yeah um day one and day one and rodney like th those videos definitely were the ones like my first grind trick i learned was crook because of Rodney, mm. you know, just that intro. It's all like orchestra or it's all like piano epic. And he's just skating in an alley with one truck. Yeah. I was like, Oh my God, how's he doing this? You got to want it basically. You know what I mean? Dude. 
So kind of like full circle to go around and then be a, on day one's team, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy how that is. There's a lot of things in my life that have happened where like even like music, my mom would show me like, this is skater music. And I'm like, mom, this is Lincoln park or mom, <laughs> you know what I mean? But this is a uh, disturbed, like some weird ass shit, you know? Yeah. But eventually, like, as I got older, like I crossed paths with, with those people that are either in the band or like are the singer, you know, uh-huh. like weird shit like that, where it's just like, it's in your life so much that like, it's unconsciously manifested into like, you're going to cross paths with these guys since they had such a big influence on your life. Yeah, no, that's true. I see that. Like that hap- happens to me. That happens to a lot of people. Same exact thing. Like, I mean, your influences are your influences. So that's, you're going to be the best version of what you're influenced by. Yeah. You just influence somebody. It's so just embedded in your memories that like along the way, you just cross paths with it. And it's almost like a, you give a what's up and then just back on, back on whatever you were doing, you know? Right. What was like the first time you got something for free? Like when you got like, maybe you were in a contest or I don't know what happened, but somebody like so, hooked you up with like wheels or. So know. there was, so Sam Schumann from 303 is like always supported. He always like chooses like a group of kids, you know, or like maybe there's that one kid that he sees can use like a helping hand or like parental guidance. Cause I didn't have like parental guidance really, you know, like mm-hmm. all the attention was kind of set towards my sister because she needed help. So like the grandparents, my mom were all focused on getting my sister the help she needed. It was like drug abuse, gang shit, like all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, so I was on my own. I just kind of like, well, I'm learning from other people's mistakes and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to do this. And so I started skating and I started skating a lot. And then you just start like meeting people. And uh, I met Angel. So Angel introduced me to a bunch of my closest friends now. That's Angel Ramirez for you. That Angel don't Ramirez. Know. Yeah. <laughs> Wild Cheetah. <laughs> All right. So he introduced me to a bunch of our close friends. Um, he was the one that introduced me to like three of three videos, uh, which is the skate shop that I skate for in Denver. Uh huh. Their 25 year anniversary is coming up, Sick. which is crazy because I've been over there for close to the 25 years, <laughs> which is Damn. fucking crazy. That rules, though. Yeah. But with that being said, Sam has supported me and Angel that whole time. And there was this group, like back when I was like coming up, it was like, what crew are you in? Like, and we were like, oh, we're Chevy crew or, you know, or we're 1086, like, but it was all about crews. But before we had our crew, there was the Tetrahedrons, which were like the hip hop homies from the 303 shop. Like they tagged and they skated and they listened to hip hop and they, they were just G's, you know, uh-huh. they looked good. They smelled good. They drove dope ass cars. Yeah. They skated 7.4 boards for like three hours. And then after that three hours was up, they'd hook me and angel up. <laughs> So like that was the first time I got something for free that was like relatively new. And that was when I was just like, I want to skate for 303. Like I want to like be a part of this because it feels like this is Denver. This feels like at some point this will do so much for kids that are growing up or have grown up like I did. Mm. Then I want to be a part of it. So I would catch multiple buses, like three or four hour bus ride to go to the skate shop and they would just put me to work, you know? So you went three hour bus ride just to get to the shop from your house. So I would get to three Oh three unannounced and I would just go and just like kind of calls havoc, just like asking for shit or like questions. And like, how do I do this? How do you, how do you grip a board? Fucking like everything you could possibly think of. And then they were just like, all right, well, we're just going to make you work today. So you're going to grip all the boards. You're going to throw trash out. And at the end of the day, we'll give you a board, you know? So it was like, how bad do you want something? And are you willing to work hard for it? 
And I was just like, fuck yeah, I want that free board. You know, my mom can't this. There's no way I'm going to get a new board unless I like work for it. So I worked at the shop unannounced. And then I would, I would, I would be someone's problem at the end of the day because I would stay (laughs) until the bus route was done. And I was like, oh shit, I got to get home. I need a ride. (laughs) And it's like, I'm your problem now. Did you ever purposely put uh, someone's trucks on backwards? Um, no, I probably maybe unconsciously, but I've always <laughs> been such a perfectionist that huh. like, I've always paid very close attention to these things, you know? Okay. Like if there's like three washers throughout the whole board, I'm going to add a fourth one, uh-huh. you know, cause I feel like it's on balanced yeah. or like, you know, stuff like that. So I, I feel like I was always pretty like straightforward. Do you keep a tight ship then? Is your is your house and stuff clean? Like you are you pretty tidy? Yeah, I'm not like crazy OCD, oh. but I I know where everything's at. You know, okay. Like, like I make it to where it's like, if I'm gonna make coffee, the coffee maker's here, and I could grab the coffee, put it in the coffee maker. Water is there. Put the water in. It's like very fluid you know this coffee smells like shit yeah that's how i like it too like a good workflow where you're not like having to run across town pull out like 16 drawers to get to the fucking q-tip it doesn't make any yeah. sense you're like what? yeah the- i have everything set <laughs> in like a group so uh-huh. it's like all of this goes together to where i could just kind of like do this hand dance you know and then it's right. all there sick dude um what was the your first tattoo when did that come? What age? I got a pentagram on my wrist. That was the first one? That's my first tattoo. I was 16. It was on June 6, 2006. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, fuck. By the way, th- I'm like raging at this time, you know? <laughs> like, I'm like drinking whiskey. I'm getting fucked up. That was a good era. I was smoking blunts and shit when I was like fucking 10 years old, you know? Because okay. I was stealing radio car radios and I was involved in like a bad situation. So like drinking was like just whatever to me. It was like second nature, you know? And it was all, also out of like good fun because one of the homies had a house. It was called the 1086 house, which is smoke weed in hell. It's 420 <laughs> plus 666. <laughs> but we had the squad, you know, it was like Angel Ramirez, fucking Derek Milton, like we had the squad, good squad too. And everyone was really talented skateboarders. And at the end of the night, we would go drink at the 1086 house and just like hang out, talk shit and talk about what we're going to do tomorrow. Like where we're going to skate. Um, so six of my friends on June 6, 2006, went to a buddy's tattoo shop uh, next to 303. And he was giving out free 666 tattoos. So I got the pentagram and then everyone else got like six, 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 like on their heart or on their like here or. So it was six, six, oh, six. It was six, six, oh, six. The date. And I was 16. (laughs) (laughs) You can't write this kids. Damn. That's sick. Yeah. All right. And that was also the first night I blacked out. Ooh. After the tat or before the tat? After the tat. I was already buzzing. And then I went and got the tattoo and then went back to the 1086 house and uh, was like super into the doors at the time. Mm. And like Jim Morrison always drank whiskey. So I was like, I'm looking at fucking 750 milliliter or milliliter of whiskey and I'm just going to get fucked up. Mm. And then I blacked out and was on the bus home. And like that, I like kind of came out of it on the bus home oh. and then had to get off the bus to throw up. <laughs> and then I called a taxi and got into the taxi, took that home, and it was still sunny outside. <laughs> you know? It was so fucked. Like, no parental guidance at all, you know? There wasn't, like, you have to be home at this time. It wasn't, like, you have to wake up for school tomorrow. It was strictly just, I'm doing whatever the fuck I want, and I'm going to learn from my own mistakes, you know? Well, it seems to me that like when you don't have like that nest that you're super comfortable in per se, that that's kind of what pushes you to skate more and more. Like you just want to be out on the street skating. Like that's your, that's your nest. Yeah. 
that's the closest thing to family, you know? Right. And you're hooking like, up with your friends, like you're drinking, you're smoking, whatever you're doing, but you're skating or you're yeah. talking about skating. It's like the common thing is always skateboarding, whether it's you're, you're partying and you're piling out, but you're still with skaters talking about skating. Like, you know what yep. I mean? And so like that kind of builds this whole life that we have where it's like, okay, fuck, I've been in this for, like you said, 25 years with the same shop. These are yep. my tight homies. Like, you know, yeah. like we've been through battle. We've been through good. We've maybe shared some ladies. Like we don't, you know, it's yeah. like Eskimo no, bros. <laughs> yeah. Like we've helped each other out like mm. in dark times, you know? Yeah. Like seeing the strongest motherfucker you've ever like seen cry, you know? Right. Seen tough motherfuckers just like at their lowest point. Yeah. And we were there for each other. Like it's, truly no D'Angelo shit where it's like, Oh, he broke into the car. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, no, we're here for each other. Do you think that's lucky or just like in your blood or like how it works out where like you kind of like saw some of this stuff. I mean, you were doing some dumb shit, but like you kind of saw like, uh, oh, this isn't the route I want to take. Like, yeah. Was it a choose your own adventure book that you got lucky or was it a little bit of like somewhere that you were scared or in your past, somebody had told you something that really clicked to your brain that you were like, I can't do that. Like that's prison ain't for me or I don't know. Yeah. See, I think, I think I just felt it, you know, uh -huh. like one, obviously knowing my father's background okay. and seeing how he treated us. Right. And then also like my sister's older than me, not by much, but she was going through it all. Okay. So I had known that I didn't have the most attention and maybe I felt pretty disconnected from where I was like my family. Like maybe I was like born to the wrong people or, you know, like I had like all these strange thoughts because it was like, I was trying to figure out who I was, where I was going to go in life because school wasn't it. You know, mm -hmm. I felt like I'm more of like an artistic, like kind of hands on, like maybe even like architecture. Like I felt like I had like a good I have like a good way of visualizing certain things. And also, I know I'm not a bad person and I know that what I do reflects who I am. So when I was doing all the bad stuff, I knew I was crossing the line, but only maybe to feel if this is the route I take subconsciously knowing that it's not okay. almost just to get that itch out to know like, yeah, you don't want to do that. You know? Right. Like that's not who you are. Right. And I would like, kind of like bounce back into line and go from there. So what age did you get your first sponsor? Maybe like 13. I think it was three or three though. 13 years old, three or three. And then I was getting like DC flow from like, a rep there was a moment i was getting like vulcan flow from um, a rep and then bones wheels and bearings by rob washburn he like came to town with like all those dudes and that was kind of like my like this is your real box you know like i'm calling hq to get a packy <laughs> yeah it wasn't like i'm gonna hit the rep up gonna wait maybe four or five months and i'm gonna get like a set of wheels you know? <laughs> yeah. It was like, no, I'm getting a box. There's like six sets of wheels. And I would just hook my friends up, you know? Mm -hmm. I'd get the box and I would just fucking deviate it out. Like, I wouldn't even really have, I'd probably have like a set of wheels at the end of the box. I gave it all away, you know? Damn. Well, did you have a demo or a sponsor me tape? I did. I actually ran into one of the dudes recently in Denver when I was with Leo and all the boys, um, we had set up a three or three demo trying to like, my goal is to rebuild the Colorado skate scene. And it's just like showing that they exist and wanting to like, for me, the people I was inspired by seemed like imaginary characters. So we went to Denver to skate and like show that we exist, you know, uh -huh. I want like a kid to feel like, there's a chance for him 
to make it out of a small town or maybe he grows up from like a shitty background or yeah. poor even. And just to know like people care and you can do it. So we set up the 303 demo and one of the dudes that I had skated with when I was a child was at the demo. And he says that he has the footage from like some of my old sponsor me tapes, you know, like my first Smith grind and like, you know, stuff like that. Uh, so pretty fucking cool. But yeah, I made, I made some sponsor me tapes. They were probably dog shit, but <laughs> you know, it, the funny thing is it's like you make these things and you're, you're just kind of learning how to like what tricks look good next to each other. And, um, like visualizing it, how you would want it to be edited or like, how do you want this to feel when you watch it? Or like, you know, from an outsider's perspective. And I was not good at it. You know, I was just like trying to get my first crook in the street. So I was trying to get like a no slide shove somewhere, you know, like I just, you're just skating at the time and getting sponsored never was really like top priority. Mm. But there was a certain point where I realized like I'm, I'm good enough. You know, I feel like I want to do this and do something good with it. You know, even if it's just like to be a glimpse of hope for a child that is passionate about something, whether it's skating or not, right. but just you know, like they can do it. You know, they can make it as long as they really focus and put their, their life on the line for it. You know, <laughs> definitely that's- made some sacrifices to like get to where I'm at today. So, yeah. That's right. What about like also just keeping you on the road, right? Like it's like I'm trying to get to the East Coast. If I get this sponsor, they'll get me there. Oh, yeah. Like that kind of shit kind of goes into it, too. It's like a lot of people think it's all about fun and games, but it's kind of like this whole thought process of like, no, I'm helping you. You're helping me kind of deal and then grow into what it is. But in the beginning, you're just trying to skate new shit. You want to go places, right? Yeah. Yeah, traveling definitely makes filming easier. Yeah. But it also broadens your like whole perspective on life. You know? Like you can teach me about fucking China, but like throw me in the fire and I'll you're gonna learn way more actually going to the place, you know. Hands on with the how the people live and hands on with the laws and how strict it is. And on top of that, you get to skate amazing spots. You know, yeah. everything's marble and untouched but like i made some wild decisions like some crazy decisions like (laughs) like i i look at like a 12 year old or like even a like 15 year old and i'm just like that is a child you know and i was wasted when i was 15 yeah and i'm just like smoking joint after joint fucking drinking whiskey like banging chicks crazy so Uh with that i like jumped in homies cars and drove to california you know like no no hey mom can i go just like yeah i'm down just uh-huh. jumped in the car and just fucking send it off to asr san diego you know right like 50 bucks to my name <laughs> and end up staying there for like six months <laughs> that's just like crazy shit like that but that's how i went that's how i met like lanny Rhodes and all those bros you know and nuge uh-huh with this, like those sacrifices it was like a friend knew a friend on myspace they would send each other edits and i was hanging out with angel and abdias and uh-huh. sheckler because they were they were doing like some bulkum shit and they were going to mexico to film for uh chichigal and they're like what do we do with david and then i got dropped off at hell rose Oh, shit. <laughs> that's where I met. That's where I met nude, Richie, J Roy, James Atkin, Baca slash like met them all one quick sweep, you know? Oh, I shit. Lived, I lived in the lizard's lair for like a couple weeks, <laughs> couple weeks. I actually might've been there for about a month, you know? Oh, but like shit. with that doesn't just come like, I got a place to stay. You know, you got to be respectful that these dudes let, you in you know so i i clean their houses i wash their bongs i wash their fucking trucks and their cars you know they gave me a place to live so like out of respect i'm gonna like hook them up too i'm gonna clean their whips i'm gonna fucking make sure that like 
their house is like cozy, you know, for them. I'm mm. not like digging through shit or going into like un- uncharted territories, but like the things that are obvious that need to be cleaned, I'm like, I got, I'm just going to, just going to clean it. So when they get back from whatever the fuck they were doing, they're just stoked, you know? What's well, like one of the craziest day or nights at Hell Rose? What, what, describe like a, a, or an average day there. Is it just everyone smoking bongs or? Yeah, but like that was like, I was already used to that shit, you know? Uh, so it so wasn't don't... like, I wasn't like, oh my God, these guys are smoking fucking pot, you know? It was more just like, this is my shit. Huh. Fucking. So it was comfortable. Roll, fucking drunk wasted just like barbecues like ban- like i don't know it's just i like shit talk and i like the environment of like no matter what i say to you you know that it's out of respect and i got your back till the end but you're being a real big bitch right now you know like <laughs> shit like that i like i like that because i i would get called out when i was younger you know sure. i do some dumb shit you got to get called out for it because you're, how else are you going to learn your lesson, you know? Mm. Um, but anyways, the main memory, one memory that resonates with me is uh, Paul Otvoss. Uh You remember Paul? Yeah. So Paul, one morning, I'm sleeping on James Atkins' couch. His, his apartment was the more domesticated one. And then once I left there, it got like more like hell rose, you know? Like, you go upstairs to New Richie's, like, there's bongs and, like, beer and shit. And, like, they're fucking listening to rock and roll and just fucking killing it. Uh-huh. So, I'm in the domesticated unit. And Paul Outlaws, everyone knows that there's a child staying in the vicinity. <laughs> and um, so, Paul comes. And I'm dead asleep. And he picks me up. And I, I, like, wake up. And I'm, like, halfway to the pool. And I just start laughing because I know what's next, you know? And he just chucks me in the pool, <laughs> you know, in my clothes and all. And I was just like, fuck, yeah, this is sick. But those dudes have had my back since then, you know, since I was like 13. Damn. And that's where I met like Cole Matthews and stuff, like all those dudes. At Elrose, you met Cole? Yeah, Cole saw me sack a rail and break my wrist. But he was like filming it, you know? Oh, shit. Like, There's so many crazy things that, like, when I think about it, that, like, from that moment, I just, for some reason, knew to, like, remember these guys. These are your homies right here, you know? At some point, you're going to be so grateful that these guys are your friends, you know? The way they, like, were, like, a fatherly figure to me and, like, took me under their wing and just, like, just accepted me, you know? And I have, like, nothing but respect for all those dudes. Was Nuge the one that got you on foundation? I think they all had a big part in doing that. What's funny though, I'm gonna backtrack a second, but yeah, the whole MySpace thing. So after I was at Hellrose for a while, I really wanted to street skate. You know, we uh, would just go to Brea Park, and like occasionally we'd hit the streets, which was like the handrail next to Brea Park. So we didn't go too far. So I had a friend. Bucky O'Connell hit up another friend that he knew from MySpace who happened to be Lanny Rhodes. Wow. So Lanny Rhodes drove up from Oceanside and picked me up and my friend Trevor up from Hell Rose in Fullerton and then just like took us skating. And then that's when I started to like, I feel get better footage. And I feel like I kind of like got to that point where I was like, I can do the tricks that I've been afraid to do in the streets. I can do them now. Because it's like a whole new perspective, and that goes with traveling. Mm. You travel to new things, certain tricks just seem to work. Well, it's your only focus, too. You don't got any comfort. You're on the road in a strange place, and you're only there to skate. Yeah. So, like, <clears throat> some people go to the bar, and some people go to the flat bar, you know? It's like, yeah, you know, hit the pay phone, what up? So, they lived in Oceanside, and Tom Yeddo is in San Diego. Yeah. So him like picking me up, bringing me that much closer to Tom Yeto. Um, And Lanny's always been connected. He's always like known like this is Rhino. He shoots for Thrasher. This is so-and-so. He films for this company. Like, oh, let's go here. Like, 
I got, I know someone that we could like skate this, this TF and like, he's always had plugs and he's always editing and he's always had like great taste in music. And he's always like, he's always doing something, but same vibe as hell Rose, you know, like we're yeah. going to like beach parties. We're going to like homies houses and just getting fucked up. But knowing that the next day we're going to fucking shred, we're going to, we're going deep, you know, we're going to drive two hours. We're going to skate all night. And then that's it, you know, living the life of a skateboarder, yeah. no school. Like we're just fuck all. This is what we're doing. Right. Yeah. So that, that pretty much helped me like get foundation flow, like officially, obviously angel was a big part of that. Um, and like Beagle and then Leo, <clears throat> like Matt Allen, like they're all like a big help when it came to that for sure. Mm. Cause then now I could go down there. <clears throat> I'm in Oceanside. Yeah. I could make a trip to skate San Diego and I could swing by HQ and be like, Peggy. I, I exist. <laughs> you know, I'm not just some child from Colorado. Like I'm actually here. I'm trying to make a, trying to make the move. I'm sacrificing my childhood life. I'm sacrificing my life to make this a dream come true. So you were there before Sinclair, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah, I was. <laughs> Hell yeah. I love I was I was there when Josh Beagle was TM. Oh, okay. Josh Beagle was the one that like started flowing me officially. Uh was Duffel um well he was pro or no? Yeah, Duffel was pro. Okay. <clears throat> Strubing uh, or was Strubing gone? Um Strubing Strubing was there. Strubing was there, Shimizu. It was like the last bits of art bars, you know? Okay. Yeah. Strubing got get, a video part of the year for that part, I think, of Transworld. That's a beautiful part. That yeah. video is so fucking good. Yeah. Just like put together so well, like you get the chills watching videos that like you'll watch something that makes you motivated and want to like go skate and you get the chills. You'll get that zap and you're just like, well, I didn't want to do shit today and now I have to go do stuff. You know, that's like what that video did for me still does. Right. Was that, so what year did do you think it was that you were on, that you got on foundation like 2005 or six or something? Yeah, probably about that. And then um, 2007 was King of the Road. 2007 was King of the Road. And was that the biggest rail you ever skated? Yeah. So that was like pretty gnarly at the time. <laughs> yeah. It was 29 stairs. <laughs> I think it might have been the biggest rail recorded at that time. You know, uh, I don't think anyone grinded more than like, I don't know, maybe like a 22 if that. Uh huh. And uh, I 50 the 29. <laughs> it was a cheater, but it worked. It was like a shotgun rail. So you just got to get on and just go. Uh huh. But the whole like getting on foundation thing was kind of like crazy. It was like I was getting flow. Beagle had left. Mm. They started kind of shifting things around. And then, you know, the old dogs like bowed out and then went did their own thing, started companies, whatever. And then the new TM was there, really had interest in this other guy. And I thought he was getting on for sure, you know. But everyone had, like, known me. Like, that we've all – I've stayed at Hell Rose before any of these guys were on, like, Foundation. Like, they were doing, like, Hell Rose or they were doing, like, you know, whatever other, other companies that they were on at that time. And now they're on Foundation. Right. They have my back and it was like a whoever can film a video part gets on foundation you know it wasn't like you deserve it the whole team has your back like boom you're you're good to go one i've never felt like i've deserved anything i've always felt like there's room for like fixing shit or like just bettering a situation i never felt i don't ever feel like you deserve this because I feel like you're putting a cap on yourself. You know, mm. it's like, you can always do better. And we're I never our felt worst, like, we're our worst critic. Yeah. So I never felt like 
I deserve much. And at some point I eventually fully got on and I was just like, whoa, that's awesome. With a sponsor or without a sponsor, I'm going to do this. I'm going to skate. I'm going to risk it. Like it's the only thing that makes me feel alive, <laughs> like putting mm-hmm. myself on the line and like out overcoming it and just being like, fuck yeah, I did that yeah. back to the off to the next, you know, like, so yeah, the, it had to have been about 2000, probably like 2004. I feel 2004. like something. Okay. I don't know. They all seriously blend in all the years and dates. Cause sure. like all I'm thinking about is t- tomorrow's going to be sunny. I'm going skating, you know, but yeah. Um, King of the road was like, but you were amateur still 2000 for King of the road, right? Yeah. And so like just being selected as part of the team to go is probably a, a fucking huge deal for you. Like, Nuge, who who was the team? I, I, I'm trying was, to think. Was Sierra maybe? So it was Eric Wall, who was the TM. Okay. Um, Sierra, Nuge, Angel, Abdias, and yeah, myself. Abdias, right. Okay, yep. yeah. And Burn Dog was our photog. Oh, shit. Okay. We had the fucking big dog. The curse of the burn dog. He he was like the guy that never won. I know. Year. I remember them saying that. <laughs> I was like, "We stick." Fuck. We got second place, uh-huh. which is pretty dope. I got Felper's choice on the fifty fifty, and I got the worst like slam, gnarliest slam, right? <laughs> so, what's so what's crazy about this fifty fifty little backstory is we're at Cream City. Um. Phelps comes up to me and he says, you're that new Rojas guy, huh? And I was like, huh? And he punched me in the chest. When you hit party time. (laughs) So I was just like, holy shit, that was crazy. (laughs) And then I go into the park. We do all our like meeting. We get our mystery skaters. Like it's fucking insane. You know, like, because I I was there Milwaukee with Jake. Yes. Okay. In the chest. So it's like, (laughs) No matter how far I've gone from the beginning, I always remain in the beginning, you know? Like, I'm always thinking of, like, how I grew up, like, who helped me, like, how, like, I can help my beginning, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, a kid that's grown up how I did, how can I help him the way I've been helped to get to where I'm at? Sure. So, even in that moment, I'm at cream city i'm on like one of the most epic skate trips ever hosted by thrasher magazine it's like such a big deal you know and i'm just like still in colorado in my head you know Uh, and i'm just like this is so amazing like i i wish like my mom could be here you know i wish like my mom could be here i wish like my closest friends could be experiencing this with me i wish the whole 1086 squad was here you know like I've always been like there I've been present, but I've always been like appreciative of every opportunity. So there's a trick in the book that you had to Bennett grind like a seven or eight, or I think it was like eight plus rail. And I was just like, we're on King of the road. Like, this is like what it's all about doing shit that you have no idea how to do learning it. And then along the way, you find the spot for it. Uh-huh. So I tried to Bennett grind some ledges at the skate park. And I think I did one. And I was like, cool. Well, as long as I have that down, I can probably make it work. I think it was like a hundred point trick because at the time, only Matt Bennett was doing Bennett grinds. Mm-hmm. And um, we do the whole thing at Cream City. Then we go to the streets and I tried to Bennett grind this rail and I got kind of close. And then Burn Dog's like, this might be the best rail we can do this on. And I was like, all right, we're going to do it. So I think a few tries later, I my truck got hung up on one of the runs that goes down. And I just got pitched to my face and just like hit this side of my face, this side of my face bruised. My ears were bruised. Like I got fucked up. Oh. I had like a delayed concussion, like, a couple weeks later, like I was fucking totaled 
that night I tried to 50, 50, like a 19. <laughs> you know? And then like, I could see the swelling on my eye, like just like dangling. And I was like, fuck, I got to like go to the hospital. So I went to the hospital and got fucking checked out and it ended up being like completely fine. They like stitched it or whatever they had to do. And, um, pretty much after that, just went back, met up with the squad and went skating. And then the next day I tried to Bennett grind another rail for like maybe like three hours, which actually ended up being an even better rail, but like didn't get the Bennett grind. No. And then the next day I 50 to 29. And at that point I had like a black eye. <laughs> fucking, I was mangled, you know, and it was yeah. from like wood pop to wood. Wait, land. Did you have the haircut already too? No, I didn't have the haircut yet. <laughs> that was so sad. Yeah. The Hasidic <laughs> Jewish haircut. Oh, wait. Okay. You got to tell the story because I go to the airport and I pick up your mystery guest. And your mystery guest has the most insane luggage I've ever fucking seen in my yeah, life. Daniel Haney. Dude, the guy brought a parachute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, I never saw the parachute, but I, he was fucking ready for anything, you know? <laughs> Holy shit. I remember me and Jake are like, what the fuck are you doing? He's like, I made a, a deal with whoever, maybe it was Burnett or whoever called him. He's like, I said, I need to bring my parachute. And they're like, bring whatever you want. He's like, I'm going <laughs> parachute, not king of the road. <laughs> so fucked. <laughs> All right. So he seriously, like, that's OG foundation, you know, like he's yeah. like king of grinds, king of board slides. Like the dude did some groundbreaking shit. And with that, he obviously is going to have to like change his lifestyle. Like as he gets older mm. to still get that thrill, but somewhere else. Yeah. And I think parachuting uh, naked was like his thing. <laughs> I think <laughs> him like skydiving ass out was like his shit wow okay you know like he was like thrill seeker still i mean that stuff resonates like we're pretty much fucked you know once we get older it's like how do we get a thrill that we got like jumping on a big ass rail or like doing a big air or like you yeah. know suffering for hours and then accomplishing something and being like okay cool i got my fix you know his is apparently skydiving naked which is pretty fucking sick dude um I I just couldn't even imagine like the, the, the boys, like you got the van and all of a sudden you see it, like the luggage was just humongous. Like, I don't know where it goes. And then you're just like, dude, what are you doing with that fucking bag? Like and it doesn't bag. have Scooby snacks in there or nothing. It's just a parachute. Oh my God. Did he act, did he go parachuting on the trip? No, not that oh. I, not what I remember. Okay. Um, I couldn't tell you, the last time I think he skated, mm. I think he just like got the invite. He's probably like dicking around here and there, mm. but like we're on King of the road. It was like, I tried to Bennett grind a rail and I smacked my head within like hours. I'm trying to 50, 50 or 19. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, the next day I'm right back to Bennett grinding another rail to grinding a 29, you know, there was even a 23 uh, rail in between that, Bennett grind in the 29 rail that like angel tried to back 50 it like oh, nudes man. tried to 50 it. Like, it's like, this isn't just your ordinary trip back yeah. then, especially like okay. this was like, this is for bragging rights. You know, we get the cover of like, this is like real deal shit and it's going to get fucking gnarly. Yep. And um, so I don't know if, I don't think he knew what he was getting himself into, but I do remember him really trying you know like he tried to board slide that 29 Did in he? days of dukes wow no shirt <laughs> like you can see like the, the bottoms of his butt cheeks you know like this motherfucker was trying to board slide at 29 and i think oh, like man. the last rail that he probably skated was probably like in the 90s you know okay Fuck. so that was, that was a good one man i remember that's just a glimpse of what like king of the road does to like your mentality yeah, what's yeah. it like for you? Like after it's over, are you on like a depression? I mean, uh, 
like how do you decompress from that high level energy and, and low sleep and stuff? Are you just like, I'm taking a week off or are you well, chilling or I've gone on two King of the roads Uh huh. and that first one I had the weekend, which we did, um, at crossroads. We like all met there and did our bit. Yeah. And then I had the weekend and then I did a Scandinavian tour. Oh fuck. So I went straight from King of the road to Norway, Finland, Sweden, and Russia. So while I was in Russia is when like the whole head shit started to happen. So, Oh, right. And then after Russia, I flew home a couple days earlier. And that's when I got like multiple cat scans and like started having like weird deja vu and like tripping out. And then I just pretty much lived in my room for like two months until like my brain like had healed. Was that was from King of the Road then? That's from King of the Road, yeah. So you went to the doctor on King of the Road. They said you were chill. And then you went to Scandinavia and you weren't chill. No, like I was Norway, Finland. And in Sweden, I started to feel a little craze. Just like not entire tunnel vision, but like a little fuzzy on the edges. Were you having uh, what's it called? Vertigo or any of that? Yeah. Like I got like. Like your Things balance is off weird, you know? Yeah. And then in Russia was when it was like, I got out of bed and like first step on the ground, I would feel the floor vibrate, you know? Oh. And then it got to the point where it was like going back to this dream that I had, that was like a reoccurring dream when I was younger. It was like, it'd start here. I'd wake up there. And then when I'd go back to sleep, it'd start from where it left off. You know, it did that for like a week. And I, I kept thinking back on the, that dream. And I was just like, this is like fully repeating all of that stuff. Because like, even in the dream, I had that feeling of like, I've never been here, but I feel like I've been here. Which is like weird, but it was fully that feeling. Like walking down a hallway in a hotel in Moscow, knowing I've never been there. But feeling that I can predict what's going to happen and feeling like I've already lived this section of my life. Whoa. It was like really fucked up, you know, kind of dreamy deja vu fully wow. for like for like months, dude. But then eventually, yeah, it was fine. I just had to like wait it out. And the way I waited it out was I overly painted my room. I paint it white. Then like the no, maybe like a few days goes by. I paint it green. Next couple of days goes by. I'll paint it blue. The whole room? Like, just like my whole room. That's what I did. I listened to music. I read and I painted. And that oh. was like it. And I played guitar when I when I felt like it, you know. Was anyone taking care of you? Um, Not really. You know, like mom's always there for me. Like, but How are you getting food and shit? Um, I would just go like make food or like, you know pretty yeah. much it okay. there was no like uber eats or anything i was just kind of like mom took care of me as much as she could and then i just fucking kind of just needed to do it all on my own you know i've never been babied yeah. you know like if if my sister and it sucks to say but if my sister wasn't in the situation that she was in when i was growing up the family's always been very attentive you know we don't have much but like they we know we have each other. Yeah. And it's fun saying that because it's like some like cliche ass fucking photo that you'll see in like grandparents house, like a live, love, laugh type of bullshit. But it's yeah. true. We don't have much, but we have each other and it's 110% true. Mm. Um, that's, that's the same with my family as well. Like it's like even like, political shit like you may be into this you may be into that but like we're still family like i got yeah. back. like the love will never it don't i mean whatever but i always love you you'll always love me like that yeah shit's but they could be complete shitheads and you don't even necessarily have to like them yeah but you know that they're your family and no matter what you have their back right and that's the beauty of unconditional love you know yeah. When were you born? What month? October. Are you a Scorpio? A Libra. 
Okay, because I'm a Scorpio. We, just, we start and, going into this, we're all yo. So. Well, no, but Scorpios are hella loyal and shit. I don't know about Libras, but I know that like it's part of my DNA is like when I read up on some of that stuff that like, dude, if you're my friend, you're my friend for life. And like, yeah. I got your back through thick and thin. Same with family and all that stuff. Sounds like similar to what you're talking about. Yeah. Sometimes loyal to a fault is what they say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you think about it, it's like, I'd rather help someone out more than I should help myself. Like I don't help myself out as much as I help other people out. And it took exactly. a while for me to get to that point of like identifying it mm. and being able to be like, okay, I need to take care of myself. Maybe just a little more then I take care of like everyone else, you know? Right. It's a, it's a thing like, especially in this uh, COVID era, I've been learning about self-help a little bit more. Like it's okay that you're not selfish for taking care of yourself. Like, you know, no. like, there's some times where you're like, Oh, that's being selfish. And you're like, no, you need to eat. Like you need to put a blanket on to stay warm, like whatever it is, like yeah. take care of yourself and all that. Like you take a shower, brush your teeth, like <laughs> yeah. get a haircut, you know? Yeah. I just did two back-to-back -back days of massages, you know? Exactly. I got a, a massage last night, a gnarly foot massage. And then I got a gnarly ass back massage the day before. Oh, what's your tech? Do you go shiatsu? What, what's your tie? What, what massage do you go with? I always just go with deep tissue and I have deep them walk tissue. on me. Are, are, they, are you yelling? Like, is it painful? Like it's while painful, they're, yeah. yeah. And then, but then I when like, it's done, you feel killer, right? Yeah. And I, I mean, I've always been the one that's just like, I'd rather hold the pain in and harness that feeling when I need it uh -huh. as, as strange as that is. But it's like, if something hurt, I know how that feels. And like, say I'm like afraid to do something skating. <clears throat> I know that I can take a lot of pain because I didn't express it when I should have, you know, mm. just so weird. But it's like, I always felt like I was much tougher if I didn't express the pain and I just held it in. <laughs> yeah. I think that's normal too. I mean, that's like a baseball player uh, when it gets hit by the pitcher, it, yeah. it it's taught to not, to not even like rub it off to just walk away. Like you didn't hurt me. Like as much yeah. pain as you're in, you just don't show it. Um, I, I know that one. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's kind of like what I do. And like, if it doesn't hurt, I don't think it's working, you know, <laughs> like I need to feel like, it feels like my bone is being like twisted out, you know, like I need mm. to feel like I need to feel it to, in order to know like it's working. Mm. I can't have some like soft tissue massage and just be like, cool. That was great. You know, there's a time and place for that massage, but yeah. like the tissue, like I need an elbow into my spine. You know, I need like, I, I need fingers out. going underneath my, uh, those blades. blades. Just, yeah. Yeah. Like, you need to like oh. feel your hand from my shoulder blade grip my heart, you know? <laughs> well, shit. Um, let's talk about what I think has to be one of, if not the highlight of your skateboarding, which would be the Thrasher cover. Yeah. Kick, kick flip wall ride. Yeah. Kick flip wall ride. Yeah first cover or did you have a cover on another magazine before oh first cover first. I, it's actually my only cover only cover my only cover yeah and i mean it was a battle you know i like i didn't do it as good as i should have it was like definitely like a baker make but there was like i tried for so many different times so i like, get a good one and it just never happened uh-huh but for what's the feeling like when it you see you're holding it or you see it like did you did someone tell you or did you see it on the newsstand did it come in the mail like how did you see it for no. the first time so i was on duffel was filming for the trans world video uh -huh. and we had just done australia and a new zealand trip 
And it was like Rhino, Duffel, Nuge, Gareth Stir, Chris Ray. And uh, we were in Auckland. And it was the last day of our trip. We get on our flight. We get back. We're waiting at customs. And then I think um, I think Rhino was the one that found out. And he just like, you got, you're got you on the cover, the new one. And I was like, what did I do? Like, I don't deserve to be on no cover. And it was like, I had a, a heads in there with Mike Mo. So <laughs> me and Mike Mo had like, an inter- he had an interview. I had an interview. And then I got the cover. And I was just like, holy shit. <laughs> and I was like, holy fuck. And yeah. I, think Phelps, I think Phelps picked that. People send me soap. Crazy. Still, yeah. Only cover I've ever had. I'm trying to get another one. Yeah. Chasing well, the dragon. Ooh, dude. What's up with the, uh, the part you just put down? So this part is for sure the first part that I've ever had, like, full control on. Full hands, like. I had a vision of how I wanted the part to look. I had an emotion that I wanted the part to portray. And I wanted to include everything that I love. Like my mom, the beginning, which is where I grew up in Denver. Like there's a lot of other 16 millimeter footage that we didn't use. Like, but the whole idea was to make the part feel like you're living a day. And you start like slow you live out your day and then the sunset. I looked up like uh, metronomes for like um, sad songs, like um, heart rate for sadness. Like I looked up a lot. I've like really went into it to just figure out like how to highlight this emotion and how to like portray it through this video part. And at the end of the day, all I wanted it to do was to make the viewer feel how I felt when I watched Ardo's part in Sorry, or when I saw Daywan's part in like uh, Rodney vs. Daywan, or like any of the old videos that I still watch today because they gave me that zap and they still continue to give me that zap. Mm. I wanted to show part in a part so that when you watch it, you get that zap and you're able to want to go out and skate, you know? And with that came a lot of life changes, you know, like I stopped drinking like almost two years ago to like really focus in on that. Um, but the main reason I stopped drinking was my mom was diagnosed with leukemia. So I had like festered an emotion to like hold it in and I was drinking, you know, but there's a two day bender that I had where it was like, I bought Coke from some chick that I've never, that I didn't even know in Nashville And then I guess it was like some Russian guy that like I was buying it from, but I don't remember buying it from him. Then I like tried to fight him and there's like a whole bunch of Russian dudes. And then when I came to out of the blackout, i like just did all the drugs in the, until the next day. And then all the emotion just like seeped out. And then that's when I had realized I had crossed the line of like, you no longer drink for fun. You now drink for sadness to cover up an emotion, to mask an emotion. Like, this is why you drink now. Mm. And I knew that if I wanted to do my best, I would have to stop drinking. Mm. So it turned into, I'm going to continue drinking today because I'm already a mess. I haven't slept. I'm still wasted, but I need to just let it rip. So I continued drinking. I flew home. And Monday, November 17th, I think it was, or 18th, was just like the new beginnings. How do I fill all these gaps now? Like the casual day drinking, the on assess drinking, the like, I'm going to just hang out and we're going to have some beers. Like we're going to party at this time. Like now I have all these empty slots that I need to fill. Mm -hmm. And then with that comes like, what are the things that you used to do as a child that you enjoyed and you just stopped doing them? And like, for me was like art, like, you know, music, um, riding a bike, like, you know, expressing yourself in other ways. 
in like an art form. Right. And um, so I just started doing all that stuff again. Right. And then it got to the point where it was like, I have no time for nothing. Literally, it's all skating, art, riding my bike, like literally whatever I can do to fill these gaps. Mm. And then the vision I had prior to sobriety to get to make this part, like became more clear. And I was just like, all right, this is how I want to do it. You know, I, I quit drinking because it had to be done. My mom is sick. If anything happens, I need to be the bigger man and like be responsible and have things kind of lined up so that my youngest sister, if she needs to live with me or like, if you know, things need to be handled, I'm coherent and I'm responsible and I can make these things happen. Right. Alongside with, I have this profession that I absolutely love and it's changed my life. I need to take full control of this and do the best I can with the time I have. And then that's when like the part really started to take off. And like that emotion that I had throughout all of the darkest times. And I just like put that into skating. Like how far into it, do you think, do you have some type of time frame that uh, it kind of clicked where it was really difficult, but you were on the right path to, I got this. It wasn't hard for me to stop drinking. It was mainly just staying busy. Like you so, could go be social at night with people and still not drink. Well, or see, would I you felt, just stop felt, being social? I all that out. Okay. I cut all that out. Yeah, I like I people I used to hang out with that I would party with kind of just like disappeared. Like it was almost like the unnecessary baggage kind of just like fell off, you know? Right. I wasn't getting phone calls to like go to the bar. It wasn't like, you know, and then I realized like I was definitely like making those phone calls, you know, and I was definitely like the leader of that pact of like, you know, lining things up to go get fucked up because obviously misery loves company. Yeah. And um, I think after the first, maybe like three months is when I was just like, I had a clear idea of how I wanted this video part to be. I had already had footage, but it was like semi, it was probably like three years old, you know, or Uh no, from the time that I was actually taking the part more serious, my footage was probably like a year and a half old. And then I filmed for like another two years. And then like in that two years was like a majority of my last part, you know? So it was like, I filmed the best stuff. I chose the the right things to do. And I had an idea of like, what are the things that I loved about skating or still love about skating? And it was always the sound, like the sound of your trucks grinding, the the ground your wheels ride on. So it was like tail smack. Yeah. So it was like brick like a graded ledge like a rail that had knobs on it like there's like things that made me like it was just free music just doing like skating you know sick dude yeah but i think really dove in i did that's where like my addiction went into i became extremely obsessive with certain tricks and um would just like countless hours like i want to learn this trick and I'd go and I'd try to learn it as good as I can possibly get it. And then I would go try to do it on something. And if it didn't work, I went back and got obsessive. Eventually, like, could do it without really thinking, you know? So that leads us to Clipper. That leads to Clipper, yeah. How many times did you go there? I went to Clipper seven times. Damn. And along that seven times, we got robbed once. There was three flights and three rental cars. I bought wood twice. I bought a hammer and nails and a two by four, six <laughs> bags of kitty litter. Yeah. What was the kitty litter for? It was all wet? It would rain or something? The day I did it, it was raining. Oh, shit. And then, um, got coffee and ate and then had to dry it off with like shirts and crap and then kitty littered everything. Waxed up. Pushed it all on the side. Uh, you got robbed at, Cl- not at Clipper though, right? You got robbed like by Embarcadero? Uh, yeah, the orange, the orange curve bench. 
Oh yeah, by uh uh huh. By like Pier Nineteen or something. Yeah, by the uh, science place. Yeah. Uh, what happened? They came after you for your camera. Yeah. So I'll I'll just start from trip number one and I'll shimmy my way down. Okay. It's not too. It won't be too long because it's one twenty. Okay. Um. So. Trip one, I had just done a bicycle ride to raise money for Bridge to Skate, which is like an after-school program in Compton. Okay. And it like helps with skating and homework. It's like a boys and girls club. Sick. I rode my bicycle from Arizona to Long Beach. It was a seven-day trip. After that trip, I wanted to film my ass off, you know? I had time to just think and dry- ride my bike, and I was just like anxious to skate. So I jumped in the Zero van with – Dane and Kurt and like Adam Arunsky and like the squad, you know, uh-huh. we just headed north. And um, once we got up to San Francisco, we skated around, we visited Duffel and like whatever. Um, we got to Clipper and obviously I still have bike legs. So like nothing's really been going wide. It's just been like pedaling down, you know? Yeah. I, um, I was like, well, I can tray flip nose, but a handrail. So I'll just try to util- I'll try to do it like that. So I tried it for about three hours. I think I got in like one and then decided to go the next day. Tried it again for like a couple more hours. Didn't happen. Got into like maybe one. So then the next time I went, it was kind of the same deal, except I had done a few at um, El Sereno Park and like a micro hubba and just like, had an idea of what it would feel like to get in and slide on a hubba. Uh-huh. And I was like, cool, that should be enough. So I went back. This was another um, driving trip. Went back up there, tried it again. I think I tried it for five hours and I got into like maybe two, you know, like feet on. There's potential. Didn't do it. Went back home. And then the fourth time was when. I started going with Dan because then at this point, like we had, we were hanging out at the house, having a fire and he had mentioned being down to like edit my part and like us being like working together on it. Uh. So like in these in between times, we're getting other footage, but now I have this clipper idea to like really make it happen. So, um, and with that Tori's behind us now. So now there's like motivation to get like, that one clip that'll be the introducing clip your ender to your part like go viral fucking whatever you know the whole bit like plan it out you think about it and you're just like do you really want to do this would you do this without any of this support behind you and it's like 110 percent. i would do this with no one you know we're gonna do it so i have a support team now we fly out there we rent a car. I try it for about five hours. No dice. I probably got into, I don't know, four or five, like potential. Then we go back, fly out, drive the same bit. Nothing happens. I try it for like five hours, you know, nothing. Get back on the flight, fly back home. <gasps> That's about the time I started to get pretty obsessive. Is like, I'm going to do as many of these as I possibly can on every skate park hub that I can go to. And I'm not posting any of it. I don't want to like blow an idea out. I don't want the surprise to be blown. I'm going to do this. I'm going to change my diet. I'm going to like go to PT every day. And I'm strictly focused on this one trick. And so I started doing that. And then one of the trips we went up there and I tried it for like a couple hours and couldn't get it. I think my, I think I was sore or something. I was just being a bitch. And then uh, we went skating other shit. It was like me, Tori, and Dan started skating other shit. And then the great ledge, the recycled plastic, like trick up, ledge drop. And then Tori wanted to go to the curve bench. So we went to the curve bench. Tori did some crazy ass trick on it and was going to do it again. Dan's looking in the footage or at the camera. And then before you know it, he's getting like jumped. And then there's like pistol. He gets like pistol whipped. And um, they take his camera. And with all of that happening, like, I'm standing over by the sign. Tori's, like, over there. Um, Dylan Whitkin is back here. And it's just, like, 
what the fuck is happening? Like this kid's running this way, cocking a gun. I have, it's like tunnel vision. It's like, what do I do right now? Do I like chuck my board? Do I try to fucking brush them? Like what the fuck do I do right now? And if I would have made any move, there was another dude behind me with a gun. Say, you know, like shit could have went so sour. Uh-huh. And I mean, it did go pretty sour, but it could have been like, there could have been casualties, you know? So yeah, we're on the phone with the police and this elder man comes up with an ID or a um, license plate number. And he says, I saw the whole thing happen. Here's their license plate number. We're talking to the cops. We exchange the license plate number with them. They, they get the kids in like five minutes. Whoa. Found out that the kids earlier that day, like beat a woman up, robbed her for her purse, um, stole the car that they were in. And then they got to us. Whoa. And what's crazy is when they got to us, the next step for them was like, kill someone, you know, because as they were running with the camera, one of the kids is like, you should have put one in them. And it's like, you know, that's when it was like, fuck. Like any single move that would have happened outside of like Dan's um, confrontation, there would have been bullets, you know, right. you would have got shot. Like one of us probably would have got shot. You better leave this shit in here. Don't be telling this is negative or not. This is life. Pretty fucking crazy. But like Tony had our back and like put us in a hotel. Dan was getting taken care of. And then, um, did Dan get fucked up? up? He got fucked up. He had like a fractured skull. Oh. Um, it was like bleeding on the back. And like, so he was in the hospital for the night. And uh, the next day, obviously, we're all like PTSD, you know? Like, we're all on edge, jittery, like we're fucked. Mm. Um, we drive. I pick him up. And I was just like, we're going to take the longest way home possible for visual stimmies just to appreciate life, you know? Mm. So we, we took the long way home. We like big, sir. We went to big, sir. Like we parked yeah. in the middle of a road that was pitch black. And all you can see is like the stars, like the Milky way. And like, like it was beautiful, you know, and we just like turned it into like a 12 hour drive home and just was like, hang out at a spot for a couple hours and just like enjoy the scenery and like soak it up, like calm, calmness, you know? Yeah. Finally got home. And then, I think it was like six, seven, eight were the last or six and seven were the last trips to do the tray flip nose blunt. And I just got even more obsessive. I was watching video part after video part to see like how they landed, where they rode off, how the hub works like, and then doing like a ridiculous amount of tray flip nose blunts on hubbas, like literally going to PT driving as far or wherever the skate park hub is that I want to try to like get it on doing it like skating flat ground doing it like five plus times on the hubba then doing it on the big hubba and then driving home doing pt stretching like diets change next day same deal next spot next hubba and then the next time we went up there i think we gave it a few weeks dan like felt better he seriously was down to do it again and we went up there we flew up there rented a car. Um, I tried it. I landed on seven of them. <laughs> did not right away. Flew home. And then the last time was like, I am going to know how to do this trick, like the back of my hand. And there will be no flying back with nothing because we're driving there. We're going to fucking drive there. I'm going to bring friends because I didn't have friends the last few times. I'm going to bring music. I'm going to fucking make it like, comfortable and i'm going to know how to do this and we're going to do this and i drove there got a hotel spent the night woke up the next day tori and Bragg flew in um tansoni drove up with me um i went and um let's see who did i pick up so i picked up Bragg, tori uber to clipper we had a breakfast it was it was like raining like real like dewy in the morning and then that's when it was like, Kitty later, fucking, we got a broom, we set up the wood, I had music playing, the sun came out briefly enough to just dry the zone up. Mm. I skated flat ground for an hour, and I think in the like first five tries, I stuck the first one. And I was like, I'm fucking doing this. 
you know, I could see you doing this. But then I had dug so deep into like the memories of just like childhood and like family and like things to be appreciative of and like just kind of went to like a dark place knowing that like when I got to Clipper, I was going to put myself in this dark place in order to know like no matter what I'm leaving with this or I'm getting fucking so smoked that I can't physically walk out of here. Mm. And I was just like, I'm fucking doing this, this trip. And um, in between tries, like a song would come on and I'd be like in the memory of like family or something. I would fully have to wipe a tear and then I would drop in, try the trick, stick it, not make it, go back up, gather myself. Like there was moments where I had to be like, you're trying something. You can't get like overly emotional because it's going to affect your next try. Just like keep this, like that anxious feeling of like, like, you know, when you get sad, you get like that anxious feeling, like you'll feel like your chest pulsating. Yeah. Like I had that feeling the whole time. And I just maintained that feeling every fucking try. And I would seriously (sighs) have to like wipe a tear, try it, fucking stick it, go back up, wipe a tear, like get close. And I think I stuck seven. And on the seventh one, I landed it and it it took like an hour. But I remember when I was riding away, I just like felt all this weight fly out of my fingertips. And I just rolled all the way to the wall. Didn't even have to push once. Like landed and just rode all the way to the end. And one tear fell down my cheek. Not even joking. Just one fucking tear just (laughs) rolled down my cheek. And then I had a panic attack. And I couldn't breathe properly for like 30 minutes. (laughs) No way. (laughs) Just like from fester, like from bringing up all that emotion. Uh It was just like, I couldn't talk properly. Like I I like was gasping for air, you know? Dude. One, one One question comes to mind when you're doing this, and this is way out of my element. So excuse me if there's a dumb question or not, but do you ever just go there and nose blend it? No. Just to like yeah. do a nose blunt and feel the coming off and rolling away, or would that not help? Like it in my mind, I'm like I nose blunt it and then I tray flip nose blunt it. Yeah, like in my head, I'm like, all right, or is that just a waste of your energy? Like this could be the one I made and I blew it by not tray flipping into it. That's how I think. Yeah, I'm just like, all right, if I'm going to, if I'm going to try this trick. For, I don't know, it's probably like 40 hours, you know, like adding all the trips up. And it was probably like a few grand of money to like make this trick happen. Like, I know for a fact I can nose blunt it, uh-huh. you know, I know like I can probably nose blunt it like first rip and be like, cool. But the difference is I'm not three flipping in into it. Mm. So it's like, me nose blending it, it's not going to do any anything for me other than just like piss me off when I stick it and knowing like I just nose blended it, you know? <laughs> okay. Like 50 50 ing it's harder than probably nose blending it because uh, it's so rounded, it's you know? Round, yep. So, like, I would skate flat ground. I would do kick flips to front heels. So, I'd do kick flip, nolly flip, fake flip, switch flip, all of them to front heels and back heels. I would go up there. I would 50 it twice and then just fucking Hail Mary. You know, I would just chuck them out there and just like see what happens. But the day that I did it and the the trip prior, I had already done probably over a hundred of them and like knew like I knew it. I knew how it felt. And I was like, all right, flat ground routine, 50 it once, like change it up have music playing your, your fucking closest dogs are there. Like you got a support system. Like you, this is things that you've been missing, you know? Mm-hmm. And with that, I also like channeled this new tool that like in, when in a situation when I need it, I can use it, which is like bringing out those emotions and like being able to like react physically on them rather than just like crying, you know, I can use them because that's what I've done my whole life is I've used the sadness and like emotion from my childhood and applied it to something positive. 
Right. You know? So I was able to find that in Colorado recently when I was out there filming a, um, filming a trip before the tray flip nose blunt. I had to use that again. And then using that, I realized like I need that for clipper. And um, so I knew, I knew I was going to get insanely close or just do it. I was confident enough to know like I can do it because of how many I've done uh-huh. and how like easy it had become because I would do like when I first started doing them, I would do one every 20 tries. And then I was like, all right. And that's on like a tiny hubba. Like that's like a curb down like a three stair, you know? Mm-hmm. And then it was like, all right, let's try to do five of them. And then try to do five in a row. And it was like, I would do like two or three and I would try it for like an hour or two. And then, all right, well, let's try to do one in under 10 tries. And then I would get one in like seven tries. And then I was like, all right, let's try to do one in under five tries. And then I would do it in like three tries. And then it was like, next time, first try. And then the next time I could do like four in a row. And then I started doing them on different hubbas. And then it was just like, all right, I'm fucking doing this. And that was the, that was the day, you know, where it was just like, I did flat ground. 50 at once. First one I tried, I got in and I slid. And I was just like, all right, we're going to fucking do this. Still took an hour. <clears throat> I stuck the fifth one I tried. And like, yeah. And then it just like got dark. I don't think I talked to anyone for like an hour of that whole trying, you know? I was just like so tuned with like my emotion that I was like, I'm doing this. Do you think you're ever going to be that committed to another trick yeah because after i landed that i was like should i do it again (laughs) you know and like i I had another weekend to film Uh. and i tried to like tray flip over like this 23 stair rail into a bank and i i had been there probably like five times and i didn't do it but as soon as i was done with that day i was like part is done i sat down with my friend jordan who wrote the song and we just exchanged ideas. I told him about my life. I told him about like the metronome and the heart rate and like all this stuff that I wanted to like involve. And like, he's a skateboarder as well. So like he knows that feeling of seeing that video part that you saw when you were a child and you got Uh, the spark. Yeah. I was like, I want that. I want this generation to feel what I felt when I started skating because it's so oversaturated that I feel like that feeling doesn't exist as much as it did when I was growing up. You didn't have to wait five years for a video to come out. And then like you get to like feed off that energy from the video, the way it was edited, the song they used, like, you know, like you actually felt like you were there when you watched the video. Right. No, hundred percent. Yeah. Wow. So he made the video part or he made the song and then he did the piano intro I was like real fixated on the uh, the organ for some reason. Mm-hmm. I wanted like I wanted like those emotional instruments like um like a harp or like a piano. And he knows how to play every instrument. And then it was just like here's a few songs, here's like how I see it. Um I had like rough drafts that I had made on my iMovie with like 16 millimeter footage that I pulled off Google and like screen recorded and like pre-edited my part to like see yeah. like what it would look like. And like, I had a vision, I had an idea and Dan executed it so well, you know, like he did such a great job and like Jordan's music, his voice, like it's very Elliot Smith, like, mm. and it's just like, it's beautiful. It's like, I confidently can say like the only project I've ever done that I'm like proud of, you know? Safe. And I've had hands on. I've never had like full control over it. Do you th- do you think that the sobriety had part of you having this intense of focus, or do you th- was it? Have you always had this kind of focus towards projects and stuff? Like you, you seem like you're really intensively deep into it. I have, but like not partying and like sobering up, like. I would all, and I always, I pictured it this way, or I thought about it this way. It's like, 
I would go probably like 60% in and I would have like the momentum to do a hundred percent, but I would party and like the progress I would make, I would have to hurdle a barrier to make this progress again, which Mm -hmm. was realistically me just making prior progress. Mm -hmm. So like going sober, I had the idea I would make progress and then I could go off more progress and more progress. And it fully helped me make this like it fully helped me go like above and beyond, like over a hundred percent in on the project, you know? Yeah, it came out great. Yeah, Dan Stoling, by the way, is the the Dan he speaks of that uh edited the part and uh films a lot of it. I'm I'm sure. A lot of it, yeah. <clears throat> well, um, we gotta wind down, but uh I gotta hear the best fucking Sheckler story, like the best trip you've ever been wined and dined on the Red Bull card or wherever you were. <laughs> like, where's the fucking we're in Dubai and you aren't gonna believe this shit, man. Like, oh my like um shit let's see so we did a costa rica trip and it was for the sheckler foundation so uh it's like for a good cause and it was like red bull sponsored it we built a skate park or we contributed to building a skate park in a very low income area and with that like we celebrate you know so like Sheckler gives me the black card and we, I go grab us some drinks and then like, we just rage in our hotels, a casino. And then like, I'm gambling and I, um, leave my card in the ATM too long and it sucks it up. (sighs) And he gives me money to like gamble and enjoy the rest of my trip. And I was just like, this is fucking insane. You know, like, the dude is seriously like he's one of my best friends. Love that guy like a brother. I'd give him a kidney if needed it. Like he seriously like wants everyone to have a great time. He wants no one to have any jam ups. Like he's gonna go above and beyond to make sure that his squad and who he's with and his friends especially are taken care of. And he is one of the sweetest fucking dudes ever. Like right. hands down, like He's as genuine as they come, you know, like he's yeah. just like, and he's sober too. He's actually coming up on like, I think he is on like three years or something like that. Damn. But like, I was going to say the bros, like all of the bros are fucking the Julian's been a little while, right? Yeah. He's like four years. Leo, I think is a couple years. Dakota's a few years. Damn. John Dixon, you know? Yeah. Dixon's been for a minute. The thing is, is like, I've always been taught, like, if someone helps you, you help them. And if you don't help them, you help someone else. And you just kind of keep passing it along, you know? And mm-hmm. it's not out of to gain anything. It's out of pure genuinity to just fucking give back and just pass it on, you know? Like, maybe him doing that, like, when I was in, like, a dark place, just, like, was, like, a reassurance. And it was just, like in a in a plan of some sort to just like keep me in line you know but damn Who's i the, definitely who? always overthought things <clears throat> and like dissected things and um that was like one trip you know but it was like damn if i could actually do that for one of my bros on a trip i would do it 100 percent, you know like my friend's trying to have a good time and his fucking card gets eaten by the ATM. Like, <laughs> Hey, I got you. You know, you're going to have fun. We're here on a trip. Yeah. No jam ups. This is a no stress zone. You figure this shit out when you leave here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's up with the tights? Are, are they still around? Yeah. We regrouped. <laughs> <laughs> the tights are back. We just did two Denver trips. Like, af- like I was saying, I got sidetracked. But after that last weekend of filming for my video part, yeah, the next day I drove to Denver to film for the 25 year anniversary 303 video, right? Which is like the next part that I've been working on. Okay, we gonna see uh, Angel Ramirez Crayle in there. There will be some <laughs> Angel Ramirez footage. Yes. <laughs> But that's like where I went. I went straight to Denver after the project and started filming for 303 video that I think comes out this year. So sick. Um, but with that, um, Leo, Dakota and Julian came out with me. And then that I was there for a month. They came out for the last two weeks. And then 
um, just recently, we did trip number two. Went out to Denver, filmed, but the tights are back. I we saw the it. Instagram clip, man. It was fucking going off. Nolly heels over huge shit and stuff. Yeah. I was like, these guys ain't playing, man. Yeah. So high the elevation, out. high maneuvers. Yeah. <laughs> so the part came out, and obviously it's like reinventing yourself. Like any kid that grew up watching me from Colorado is like as old as I am, or like, you know. Yeah. Um, so there's a new generation. I wanted to highlight that I am from Colorado. This is where it all began for me. Mm -hmm. And I want to just be a glimpse of hope for any other kid from Colorado or any Midwest, like, you know, center of the United States that wants it to be, wants to like pursue something, whether it's skating, art, music, whatever. And I just wanted to like highlight that and rebuild the Colorado skate scene to bring that hype back. Mm -hmm. So on the second trip, um, kids have seen my video part. People know who Leo, Dakota, and Julian are. And we made a demo happen with 303. And we also set up a concert with Leo and then Marissa Del Santos. No way. So it was like a full thing. It was like, come to Arvada Skate Park. We're going to yes. do a skate with us. You hang out. We fucking skate the park. And then after this, if you weren't able to make it and you're 21 and over, we're going to this bar. Marissa Del Santos and Leo Romero are playing a set. Is Marissa living in Denver now? Marissa lives in Denver, yeah. Oh, sick. Is she skating still? She's shredding, yeah. Fuck, she's, she's shredding. She's, she's in like a, a few bands. She just fucking slaps the bass and fucking rips. I got to hit her up. She's right. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Ladies is one of her bands. They fucking rip. It's amazing. To, I know you're in tune with it to see all the lady rippers. Like, I talked to the girls, like Lizzie and stuff, and it's like, I've known them for years. And so seeing like it go from a small group to a bigger group to like everybody almost now, it's pretty rad. Like to see like, holy shit. The level is fucked. Like I, I was just at street league in Utah huh. and like girls are front blending the big rail, you know, like yeah. front crooking it, like switch flipping shit and just yeah. like, and they're like 13. Yeah. That yeah. girl from Brazil, that little girl is so gnarly. <laughs> like, She's so sick. Uh, and just like, I've always been infatuated with the stories, you know? I really like tacos. The years, the couple of years that I've been sober, like, obviously I would have those nights of just like Coke talk where you're just like talking people's ears off. Yeah. But it would always just be like my friend. I would just be talking his ear off. And I was always just like, I want to be a glimpse of hope. I want to be a glimpse of hope. I just want someone to know how I grew up, where I came from, the amount of work I put into like skating. And like, I would do it without sponsors. I would do it the same way I did in the beginning because I absolutely love it. And it's so positive And it like got me out of what I could have been in. And like watching her skate and knowing like the background of like her story and like where she's from and like, it's fucking beautiful, you know, yeah. and she's seriously inspiring so many, so many young wit, like girls that are just like, maybe don't think like skating's like a girl sport, you know, right. but it's like, you know, like Alyssa was definitely like the foundation of it. And then just like, you know, now you got these girls that are just like fucking shit up and they're <laughs> so young and they're positive and they're just like inspiring so many kids and like, I have nothing but respect for that because that's the goal is to like inspire a generation to do better than the last generation to inspire the next generation. Yeah. What I think too, I always say is that they continually make everything they're doing look fun. Like yeah. they're having a fucking blast doing it. And that's what skate point supposed to be like. I mean, you have your mental tortures for your tricks and stuff, but like at the yeah. end of the day, it's about smiling and having a blast. And they're they're yep. doing that like they're having yeah. fun and, and it really shows. So I, I, I get hyped on that. Uh, who are our top picks for Sodi this year? I mean, obviously you have Uto. Uto. And then, uh, Felipe, like very groundbreaking, like inspiring. Like I'm thinking uh, it might be the year of my friend Evan Smith. Evan Smith, yeah. 
I don't know. I mean, he's always a runner up. I feel you know? like he's skater of the decade right now. Like he's top three the last five years. Yeah. No, he's always been, always been my vote, you know? Yeah. But Utah like, is yeah. n- next level. It's too. Utah is fucking dope. Yeah. I mean, Evan is the homie, you know? Uh-huh. Like they're all friends. We all know each other, but we don't, you know? Right. It's just like the skate world. We know of each other, but we don't really know. Like, I know, I know Evan. You know, I know how much hard work he does, and like that Bay Bridge like, cover is so fucking radical. That's legendary. Yeah, you know? that's historical. Yeah, so. and then the frontside flip wall ride, like fuck. That's the shit that we live for. I know, dude. I love Evan. Well, it'll be interesting because there's still more parts to drop. Like pretty soon, it becomes like. Tyshawn, this guy, that guy, every day it's like the gnarliest thing. I mean, Descenzo had an insane part earlier this year, too. I seen some new Foy footage. So. I mean, David Reyes has got to be in the conversation, you know? Shut out. Let's, let's I, would, I would love to be a runner up for sure, you know? Yeah. It's going to um, be interesting. But I haven't had a cover, and I think that kind of goes with it, unless the, mm. the old ways doesn't apply anymore. But I've always seen it as. He's had a cover. He had an early video part. He had an interview, you know? And, like, I have, like, one of those things checked. So I'm just mm-hmm. like, can I squeeze it in? Is it possible? Like, you never know, you know? Time to call Burn Dog. What's the next issue looking like? I think I might have a front burn. for you. <laughs> I need um, – I'll send you some photos. <laughs> well, shit, dude. I could talk to you forever. I fucking love you. Hey, this shirt was given to me by you. So yeah. I'm, I'm wondering what your feelings are. If I do a collab, do I do Schmidt's it or it's Schmidt? Damn. It's Schmidt is pretty fucking sick. <laughs> But they're both so good. Schmidt's it. I think that that's Schmidting. Uh, what's your favorite one? You like the the mint one, or which one do you go with? I like a diva. I like the pumpkin one. The pumpkin one. That pumpkin. one's seasonal. Yeah, I like the pumpkin one. Strawberry. Strawberries. Those are new. Oh, Those are new to the circuit. And I always like the cappuccino the, one a lot. Cappuccino is my next one. Cappuccinos. They're all so fucking good. The mint bomb. And then I was going to ask you, what was the name of those things that uh, like you and Leo, I would meet you guys at the mall to, at some fucking restaurant that like you had, like they were a baked cookie. Is it a snickerdoodle or something? I forget what it's called. Um, what, it's what, the, uh, city by the uh, in the mall. It's in like some brewery restaurant and they bring them out in a hot pan and it's a huge cookie with like, oh, Pazuki. Yeah. Yeah. Bazooki. It comes in a skillet. Love yeah, it. that thing is bomb. <laughs> yeah. It's like a cast iron with a cookie that's probably like an inch deep uh, with like four scoops of vanilla ice cream. Whoa, slow it down. It is fucked. I've been back in, I got married and the day I stopped. Uh, so January 1st, I was like, I got to stop eating ice cream. So I didn't eat ice cream the entire year. The day after I got married, I had French toast and have had a pint of Ben and Jerry's every day. since. <laughs> <laughs> is that, is that real? I'm so stoked for you, man. Through all of like the shit that's gone down this year, you managed to make uh. your wedding. I know it wasn't easy, but we we've pulled it in the end. We just we kind of had your that same mentality as you like the last flight. It's like, no, no matter who's there, no matter what, what we're doing it. There's so many distractions that like come with it. Like, oh, is this person going to make it like what about this? How many people this that this? And then like finally, at one point, we looked at each other and we're like, no, just me and you. Whatever else. Who cares? That's what matters, you know? Like, yeah. And it ended up other? being amazing. It was a great day. Oh, I'm so proud of you guys. I'm so stoked. Yeah. It's like, at the end of the day, it's like, you guys, you know? You guys right. met each other. You fell for each other. Like, this is for you, you know? Yeah. This isn't, you don't have to wait on anyone. Right. Obviously, that's like the dream where it's like, huge wedding, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I was so stoked when uh, I saw it happening. I was like, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, me too. It was, it, it was a similar thing to you saying, like the, like as it was happening, I just felt these things coming out of my fingertips and like, just like the tension and everything. It was this release where you're like, and my mouth just couldn't stop smiling. It was like I was on ecstasy or something. I was that is like, so yeah. awesome, dude. Yeah, when we were looking at each other, we we promised each other. We we're like, no matter what, we're just going to look at each other and smile the whole time. And, and it was like impossible not to. So it was really cool. Oh, it's fucking so sick, dude. Yeah. Was Copenhagen good? Copenhagen was in fucking credible. Yeah. Like. It was so nice to see people laughing and hanging out and just like cheersing beers and smoking a thousand cigarettes and just fucking skating. And if you weren't skating, you were just like hanging out, like having a great fucking time. Like um, I was, I went to like some five star restaurant, ate like a baller ass dish, like, you know, like things that you don't get in the States. And it's just like, why is everyone so uptight? You know, yeah. Copenhagen's like, the best. It was just like I'm getting served in the gutter. I'm like <laughs> fucking smoking cigarettes, like. But it was just like everyone was so happy, uh. and it was just a beautiful thing, you know. And then like all the side missions and the transportation and the women and the food and like it was fucked, man. It was absolutely incredible. It was like, all right, I think we're all gonna be okay. Yeah, that's what I'm feeling too. We gotta be, yeah. we're all gonna be okay. Let's fucking just be okay. Let's just be okay, you know? Yeah, right. Uh, quick one shout out to like any of your sponsors that you want to mention. And then uh, we always end with a song that you want to fucking throw on the old jukebox. Hey, well, first and foremost, 303. Shout out. Got to thank Sam Schumann for Shout like out. always having my back and holding down the Colorado skate scene and, you know, giving like a child as myself an opportunity to really be like an individual and feel accepted. And then obviously fucking. I, I need a 303 sticker for my skate shop wall, by the way. Yeah, I'll get you a box. <laughs> okay, we'll get sticky. you a box out. Okay. Get some shirts some stickers they actually just did like a shorties knockoff which is pretty sick oh rad yeah um and then obviously like fucking Mickey Reyes for shout putting out. me on like Spitfire and Thunder you know Nate Alton and shout out fucking Jim Thebo shout out Alden <laughs> shout out Tori Pudwell like shout everyone out. that's been at like Foundation and Tom Yeto like shout out Day One shout out Fucking my mom. Shout out. My friends. And a beautiful day. You know, liquid death. Shout out. Yes. What about this? Happy hour. Shout out. Yep. We're putting this on right now, actually. I forgot. Yes. We got Bones Bearing, Bones Swiss. Like Shout out. Diamond. Shout out. It's just crazy knowing that Deluxe has supported me just about as long as 303 has wow you know so every time i order a box i'm expecting it to be my last <laughs> but it's just it just isn't it's Lifer. just they've, they've supported me for my whole fucking existence and i wouldn't want to skate for anything other than spitfire and thunder spitfire is the best Fire is the fucking best. Thunder's the best. The whole deluxe family, the fucking best. Yeah. Yeah. Just so hyped. Sick, I feel dude. like I'm a part of the skate world again. You know? The the video part, the uh the amount of support I've gotten from everyone outside of it. Like yeah. I couldn't That's be great. more grateful. Yeah, you seem like you're in a really good place. I'm stoked for you. Thank you. Yeah, I think sobering up is probably a really solid idea, you know? That's what happens. We don't have any regrets, but we like to live in the in the now. And right now, it's not a good time to be fucking up. <laughs> it's true. You know? And it was just like one of those things where it was like it had to happen. And it's unfortunate, the circumstances, but it's still like, that's life, you know? Yeah. 
you get put in these tests where it's like, do you want to like go the negative route in this situation and just like drink your sorrows away? Or do you want to use this as a positive and like be the man or mm. the woman, you know, like, do you want to take charge and like control your life and like, you know, well, what's, yeah. what's the jam that we fucking need to listen to to get us in the right zone? Um, let's see. What's that song? It's like, the fun is just begun. You know that song? Yeah. It's like the first song that popped in my head, and I don't even know who sings it. I've been listening to Miley Cyrus and like Billie Eilish. Oh, yeah. Have you seen the Billie Eilish uh, documentary? I did. I want to see it. I heard it's pretty heavy. It is. It's great. Okay. That was like one of the things I used to do, like when I was partying, like towards the end of my sh- my fucking rampage, I would watch interviews of like Beyonce, Jay Z, and like older interviews with like the greats. You know, like what makes these people so great? And it was like their work ethic, like the amount of hours they put into something passionate that they're passionate about. And then like you watch the Billie Eilish documentary and you're just like family oriented, like absolutely insane. Like the, the amount of love that they have for each other. And like, so I, I like, I really appreciate the story part of like how they come up, you know? Well, we love that shit. Me and uh, my wife have watched, I'm think it's 96 documentaries during the uh, lockdown era. Yeah. It was like, that was what we got into. I mean, I'm, you know, I hate to say it, but I think it's clear. I have an addictive personality. Like when I go into something, I just go like full bore. And that's why sometimes it's either yes or no. Like I can't do like in between. So we went documentaries and it was like every night, like which one are we going to watch? And we would write this huge list and check them off. And it was really fun. So that's one I haven't seen yet though. I want to check it. That one's great. See, I, I, I like that. Like, I like the, I want to see their personality, you know? I want to yeah. see them, like, talk shit to the reporter and just be like, this motherfucker doesn't know shit, and they're just trying to, like, get some weird information out of me. You know what I mean? Like, I like to see, I like to watch that shit. I'm just like, fuck yeah. These guys just want to, like, drink beer, make music, and get fucked up. <laughs> I think this song is The Carpenters, We've Only Just Begun. Mm, that's it. I found it. Yeah. Well, dude, good luck with fucking um, that Red Bull contest. Hopefully you win. Get some Skrilla. Some Skrilla. The only thing I know about Red Bull is when you put it into a pint glass and drop a shot of Jaeger into it. It's uh goodbye time. It's like, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what happens after this. Yeah. <laughs> after La Vista, baby. The old fucking see you later. You ain't ready. The old Jaeger bomb. That's how we started our, when we were partying at the end, that's how we would start our parties was like, okay, we'd meet at the bar. You get a beer and a Jaeger bomb, do the Jaeger bomb and go, let's go. Yeah. Like, Fuck. No wonder my stomach's a wreck. Yeah. <laughs> It's fucking crazy. I don't think I can do it anymore, you know? No, I know I can't. That's why I stopped. <laughs> like, I was just like, holy shit. Yeah. The amount of energy put into keeping the night going. And exactly. the amount of money, sleep deprivation. Like, I already don't sleep much. So it's like. Yeah. I really didn't sleep then. Well, you're my morning bro, dude. If you ever fucking scramble and running, bouncing off the walls, you know, just text or call me because I'm up at six. Like I'm Fuck up yeah. every, I'm an early guy now. I think yep. it has something to do with getting older, but it's probably like not drinking too. Like I used to sleep in a lot with the hangovers and stuff. Yep. And now I'm just up and ready to go when I'm up. See, that's the beauty though. It's like you wake up with the day. Yeah. You live out the day. And you get to watch the sunset, you know, it's like, I love it. I never thought I would thing. love being a morning guy, but I like acclimating the life. Like you're up before everyone. So you can just spend all your time right then with yourself. And then yep. as people wake up and things start going, you acclimate into this daily routine. Yeah. That's what, like one of the things in the beginning is like, I would wake up at like four 30 in the morning mm. because I was just like, <sighs> I'm going to just go with how my body feels. I'm well rested. It right. wants to be up at four 30 in the morning. 
Fuck. I would shower. I would do like yoga and I would like start working on an art project, you know? Uh. And then it would just be like, all right, now it's seven o'clock and I've done literally everything that I would have to do in the morning. So then it's like, how do I fill these slots? It's like, I'll just start going on gnarly bike rides. Mm. And then it's like, 12 o'clock i still have a whole fucking day what do i do now you know it's like, <laughs> fuck. yeah it's a curse in some ways it's a blessing and it's a curse you're like fuck i can't sleep you just but have I- to stay busy yeah for sure and just hone a craft and exercise and like just feel good mm. we're so lucky that we get to like wake up every morning you know Fuck, we're, yeah. we're just so stoked that we woke up today you know we get to just experience like a beautiful day have that cup of coffee and wear the it's it shirt you know like we get to fucking we get to do this we get to talk be friends and like experience beautiful things it's a beautiful thing you know i'll tell you what's beautiful right now is the sun burst coming right into your head as you're driving down the highway that's yeah. a beautiful thing. And I can't wait to fucking be IRL, as the kids say, in real life with the fucking it's it salute, dude. For yes. sure. Get to SF. or I, We might be coming down your way, too, actually. Are you still in Long Beach? I am, yeah. Okay. Uh, I got to skate Lizzie's ramp, and I got to get to San Diego. So I'm trying to figure it out. But uh, if I do, I'll Great hit you up ramp. for sure. Yep. Let's okay. do this. Let's get some fucking dinner some slash grinds and fucking hugs yeah all right high fives and hugs all right well let's uh let karen carpenter take us out of here yes big love man i'll talk to you soon love you brother thank you dave thank you for listening to another episode of talking schmidt you can subscribe to the show on itunes anchor spotify or anywhere you get your podcasts When you subscribe, you'll get notifications every Tuesday of new episodes the minute they become available. Also, please leave reviews and a five-star rating. It's the best way to help the show grow. All of the episodes will always remain free, but if you would like to help support the show, you can do so at TalkingSchmidt.com, where you can pick up some merchandise like t-shirts, beanies, hats, and stickers. The website has an entire archive of all of the episodes, with extra photos and videos. Email us with any suggestions, comments, or ways that the show may have improved your life at talkingschmidt at gmail.com. All interviews are conducted, edited, and produced by Schmitty. The intro music is Mary's Cross by the band Nature. Very special shout-out goes to the executive director, Cheryl Camisa. Shout-out. Love it! This is Talking Schmidt, where the Rolodex is deep, but the conversation is deeper.